Let's rank the worst deaths in human history with this tier list, some of which are wild, some of which were weird as heck. Pope Adrian IV. Well, Nicholas Breakspear by birth was the only English person to be a pope, a pretty Viking last name for a pope to be honest. On the 1st of September, 1159, he was enjoying his meal with wine when he choked. Did foot get stuck in his mouth? Did he not chew properly? No. Witnesses at that time said that they saw a fly, either in the wine or rocketed to his mouth when he was taking a drink. Of all the ways this dude could have died, he choked on a fly. You know what's worse than that? Dying from laughing at your own joke. Ask Chrysippus here. I mean, it was 815 years too early before the Heimlich maneuver got invented, so he just choked there. With a fly in his mouth, everyone didn't know what to do. And dead. End scene. But some historians actually think this wasn't the case. They think that Pope Adrian IV died from Quincy, a leveled up, powered up, one upped version of tonsillitis. They also think that the fly was just a mere coincidence, so I can put his death in this video. It was close to impossible to treat Quincy's in the 10th century. Simply because the meta then was if you feel something bad anywhere in your body, oop, you'll get a hole drilled in your skull. Doesn't matter what he died from. Adrian IV had five years of Pope time. After the fly put him in a rear naked choke, there were wild things that happened. This guy's supporters battled this guy's supporters. The church was divided and they turned down for what? For this guy to be the Pope. Good start. You go to F tier. Death by fly is just stupid. It could be a good heavy metal band name at best. Frank Devereaux. Frank Devereaux was a hunter, a poacher, or whatever job kills animals for food and leather. On the 4th of September, 1883, he went into the woods near Cheboygan, Michigan to hunt animals. This wood was full of black bears roaming around in their communities. Frank happened to have crossed paths with one of them, so yeah, tough luck. But sit down, Liam Neeson fighting wolves. Frank went out fighting like the Giga Chad he was. He literally stood toe to toe with the bear. About a radius of 20 feet of the battlefield's ground was damaged because of how Frank fought the bear. It was believed that my guy only had his hunting knife and a secondary weapon. But these things were enough against the bear's weight and claws. The fight continued until both of them stopped. I mean both of them died, so of course they'd stop. When the bear's body was found, it was dead. Same goes with Frank's. But Frank's body was in a more catastrophic state. His body got mutilated. Deep wounds in the shape of the bear claws and teeth. Good game, Frank Devereaux. This one belongs to A tier. He might have died, but he died killing the one that killed him too. The perfect battle ended in a draw. John Jones. This John Jones is still alive and kicking. Literally. This John Jones is not. It's because 26-year-old John Jones was an amateur spelunker, a guy who studies caves by exploring them. In the 24th of November 2009, they went to the Nutty Putty Cave. You've probably heard of this story, but let me tell it to you anyway. The cave is filled with narrow passageways that are not meant for claustrophobic people, primarily because people with claustrophobia would sweat and shake and breathe fast and get dizzy in these places. I mean, have you seen the passages in Nutty Putty? It's this small in the entrance. There are more smaller ones on the inside. John, his brother Josh, and some other family members tagged along for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving? What? Really? Thanksgiving? I mean, no judgment. John had some caving experience when he was a kid, but this time, he was in med school, and he hadn't done this in such a long time. So he may not be dog water, but he sure had some skill gap. When the group made it into the cave, they tried to go to the part known as the birth canal. It's a tight one, but if you have experience, you can tight through it. Josh went in first, but to his mistake, he slithered into the wrong canal. The tunnel was never listed, but it was narrower than the one they intended to go to. When John went in, he got stuck in a downward slope that was tighter than a room with Gorlock the Destroyer in it. To make matters worse, he was upside down. The space that John was able to move in was only a 25 by 45 centimeter space, or 10 by 18 inches in eagle measurement, like this. It was impossible to move because each move he does puts him deeper and deeper in the passageway. It gets tighter, every time even. Josh immediately went out of the cave to call for help. More than a hundred rescuers went to the Nutty Putty Cave to try and free John up. Because the cave was unwelcoming to huge amount of people, having a hundred men didn't really help that much for John. The rescue team tried a whole lot of ways to save Johnny. Rope and pulley? Didn't work. His angle was awkward, his weight was in the way, the tunnel was narrow. They also tried to make the gap he's in a little large with drills and chisels. Again. Didn't work. It's too tight, so there was only so much those tools could do. They were big, the gap was too small. While the Nutty Putty Cave is predominantly made up of an easily crumbling type of rock called hydrothermal gypsum, 
The place John was stuck in wasn't. Not even a small tool like a ball-peen hammer could help with anything. Their last resort was to cut John's legs, but that had more chance of him dying than living. If you cut his legs after being compressed that tight for that long, boom. A shock, cardiac arrest, and dead. After more than 24 hours of trying to sort this massive problem, John was getting worse. He was in an almost upside-down position. The blood was rushing to his head, so the heart went boom 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 twice as hard to maintain blood cycle through the body. There was a point that the rescuers got him to move a few inches. Hey ho, what do you know? The pulley system broke. John slipped back to where he originally was. John talked to his family and rescuers the entire time. But after 27 hours of trying to remove an awkwardly positioned man in a literal tight spot, John Jones died from cardiac arrest. He died on the 25th of November, 2009. John couldn't be recovered and it was decided not to try anything anymore because it was too risky even after he died. So the Nutty Putty Cave was permanently closed as it became John's grave and memorial site. Having an entire cave as your tomb is both sad and awesome at the same time. Mostly the sad one. Because of that, I'ma put it at B tier. Giles Corey. Giles was from England. He moved to a village in Salem to be a farmer. Correction, a big farmer. He didn't get big by being an honest man. Has anyone ever been? In 1675, he was fined for beating a servant to the next life. Kind of why he's on this list. When people got so pressed about possible witches in Salem, they did so many witch trials in 1692, most of which were either injustice, popular opinion-based, biased, or stupid. One of the victims of these trials was Giles's wife, Martha. Martha was accused of witchcraft, something that Giles was so supportive of. His reason was because Martha was reading strange books. Oh my goodness! Women can read! She's a witch! Hey Martha, do you remember what Giles said to bring for the party? I think, you think witch! Ouch! What's with that flower? It stabbed me. I read that in the encyclopedia. It's called a rose. Roses have thorns. All right, that's it. You're coming with us. Another reason Giles backed the idea was because she stopped him from praying. Okay, you don't impose your beliefs on someone who doesn't have the same belief as yours. That's wrong. But come on. Witch trial? Really? I mean, for a 15th century Salem where Jesus is like the center of the universe? Sure, but witch trial? cuckoo in the head. But Giles immediately took back his support. That wasn't good. He just put a target on his back. Martha was arrested on the 19th of March, 1692. The husband was arrested literally a month after. It wasn't that hard to put something on him considering Giles's past. All the people had to do was get the stories of little girls claiming they saw witches, and they'd buy it. Let's just say what he did before. Well, it bit him in the ass. Shouldn't have killed the man, Giles. And now the Bonnie and Clyde of Salem were both arrested. Giles was put on trial in September 1692, just for formality, because no one actually won a witch trial as the defendant. When the judge asked him what his plea would be, guess what he answered? I'll give you three seconds. Nothing. He pleaded nothing because he just stood there and said nothing in an act called standing mute. There's at least three types of pleas, but he chose none of them. Now the court can't move on with the trial. Smart move, brave move, risky move. They need him to plead something. So to force it out of him, the court Latinized the witch out of Giles and imposed peine forte et dure. It was this torture method where the defendant, who we know will never win the trial, will be pressed with heavy stones until they plead something or die. Giles went through this on the 17th of September, 1692, on a field just beside the Salem jail. He was laid on the ground butt naked. A board was put on his body, and the rocks were placed on that board. Sheriff George Corwin and his lackeys kept pressing and pressing Giles to say something. Well, he said something, just not what they wanted to hear. It was more weight, so they continued putting more rocks on the board. By the next day, the weight was just so much his body gave out. Giles's tongue was swollen and is showing out his mouth because of the pressure. Sheriff Hatewitch here forced back in with a cane. Giles never screamed nor cried throughout this entire session. No plea until he died. This belongs in S tier because it was a smart choice too. Without a plea, his properties can't be taken by Massachusetts and it can be passed down to generations. Plus, he saved his dignity by taking back what he said about his wife. Took tons of rocks, tanked it, but never took a knee. Hell of a man. Conorak Synthesomphone Conorak Synthesomphone was a 14-year-old Laotian American boy. On the 26th of May 1991, Jeffrey Dahmer kidnapped Conorak. Although this wasn't the first time the two saw each other, three years before, Jeffrey Dahmer hit on Conorak's brother, Somsak. 
He enticed Somsack to his apartment to pose for money. You know what pose I'm meaning. It's Jeffrey Dahmer. What else could I possibly have to explain to you? The kid thought that it was a chance for financial freedom for his family. Nope, it wasn't. Jeffrey roofied Conorak and experimented on him. He drilled a hole in the kid's head and injected hydrochloric acid directly into Conorak's brain. It was said that he did this to make a submissive zombie out of the child. It was amazing that Conorak even got conscious again and escaped Jeff's apartment. He walked the streets naked, zooted, wounded, and trepanated. If you saw this child walking around with a Phineas Gage in his head, you'd be concerned. That's what three women who saw Conorak did. Call 911. This is Officer John Balserzak, and this is Joseph Gabrish. They got to where the kid was. But holy crap. A wild Jeffrey Dahmer appeared out of nowhere. Jeffrey used Convince. It was highly effective. How? Dahmer just told the cops that the kid was his 19-year-old boyfriend who got wasted drunk. A naked child with a hole in his head was wasted. Yes. And the cops bought that crap. They returned Conorak to Dahmer, even if the women kept telling the officers that what Dahmer had with him was an injured child. Doesn't matter. Follow the cops or you'll get kneed on the neck. Even when Dahmer had records of being a predator, he got the kid. The officers didn't know any better of this man's past. The moment the two were back in the apartment, Dahmer injected more acid to the kid's brain. Well, that killed Conorak. But it's Jeffrey Dahmer. He wouldn't just kill a kid. What do you think Jeffrey Dahmer was? A predator with some kind of cannibalistic instances. Yes, he is. He ripped Conorak's body apart, limb by limb like some Thanksgiving turkey and stored some parts with another man, Tony Hughes. He got Dahmer just three days before Conorak. Jeffrey Dahmer got arrested on the 22nd of July, 1991, when his apartment was searched. Boom. 11 bodies, stored, and then Evan Peters got a series out of it. Since this is a Dahmer-related death, I'm inclined to put it at S tier. But because it's Jeffrey Dahmer, I'll go put it at B tier for boys. Georgi Dosa. Georgi Dosa was the leader of the New Crusade versus the Ottoman Empire in 1514 from the Kingdom of Hungary, today's Transylvania. Blah, blah, blah. Fighting, fighting, I won't get into that. Basically, Georgi's rule was overthrown by a stronger army. Not much of an army if you have 20,000 peasants with you. Georgi was sentenced to death in a mocking way. All the things he wanted to see in the world, he'll get it. This was done to warn anyone that if they try going against the law back then, they die. Georgi was forced to sit on a throne. Nice. A king. But the throne was scorching hot, so his ass and his back were burned. Then a red iron crown was put on his head. Wait, that's not red naturally? Then what's making it red? It was scorching hot too? Well then. He just got the Jesus crown treatment. A scepter was in his hand. Of course, that one was hot as well. Okay, physical torture, done. Time for the mental one. Nine of Georgi's rebels were starved before his execution. The leader of this rebel group was his brother, Gurgli. No, please don't kill my brother, said Georgi, thinking that would work. Okay, we won't, said the guards. Nah, just kidding. They didn't say that. They boom, 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 sliced Gurgli in three parts. Then the rest of the rebels were forced to eat Gurgli's body parts like he was a mere fritz. If you don't eat it and you were a rebel, you'll get sliced too and be a part of the feast. After a few hours, Georgi eventually died. Who wouldn't? Hot everything is basically hell. He was cut in four pieces and these parts were sent across Hungary as a warning. They kill, as a warning, to not be killed, very cartel. Now this one is S tier. Not only did he die brutally, so did his brother. Yorgi's was just a slower, more brutal way to go. Ishikawa Goemon. While this is leaning towards a myth more than something that actually happened, there's no way the Japanese didn't come up with this myth and didn't pull through with doing it. Ishikawa Goemon was Japan's version of Robin Hood, so you can call him Rabbing Hudo. Because he thought the end justified his means, he'd be able to get away with stealing from wealthy feudal lords and merchants. Warlord Toyotomi Hideyoshi didn't like thieves, or criminals in general. Ishikawa tried the merciful way of stopping someone from hating you. By killing him. Didn't work. Ninja Boy got caught by one of Toyotomi's generals, Sengoku Hidehisa. Time for the punishment. On the 8th of October 1594, Ishikawa was sentenced to be boiled alive in oil. No rotisserie, no baked, deep fried. It was for the public to see in Kamagawa, Kyoto. Assault on the wound was that Ishikawa's five-year-old son, Ichiro, was the child who would die with him in that pot. The hell did little man do? Nothing. He did nothing. Toyotomi was not very mindful, nor very demure of Ishikawa. He thought the entire family was a threat to be Robin Hood in the future, so he took care of that. When the two got put in the pot, 
Ishikawa put his son above his head to keep him safe, even while Ishikawa's lower bodies turning into Chichiran. Didn't take long for Ishikawa to die and drop his child, and boom. Fried father-son platter. This one goes to S tier 2. His death was the definition of gory gory what a hell of a way to die. Plus, the kid. William the Conqueror? Or William the First? Doesn't matter, it was the same person. See, in 1087, William was 59. That was way past the life expectancy of someone from that time which was 30 to 40 years, simply because of how limited the range of their medical capability was. Reaching that age was already a good feat. What's not a good thing was he was in the middle of war, leading an army to fight King Philip I of France. On the 15th of August, William's horsey reared while he was attacking Mons. Newton's first law made William go to the saddle pommel really bad. This is a saddle pommel. If you're sitting on that horse and hit your body there at high speed until you stop, you may live, but not for long without proper medical care. Exactly what happened to William. Internal damages, blah blah blah, all that because the pommel pressed his stomach. That ripped his intestines. A few weeks later. Let's check on William. Hello William, how are, ya? Yeah, what is that? Is that, is that gangrene? What's happening to you man? William right here spent his last days in Rouen. He wasn't able to walk, he wasn't able to fight, he was there writing his last will already. As his lawyer, which for legal purposes is a joke. It says here that you, Robert Curthos, would get Normandy. It's not gonna get wasted until Operation Overlord in 1944, so you're cool. Besides, the Normandy you have is in UK. That one's in France. It's not yours. Don't try to take it, or you'll end up like your father. William Rufus. You're the king. Congrats, kiddo. People will paint your descendant and surround his head with red. There'll be nothing you can do about it because you're dead by then. On the 9th of September, 1087, William's first death came. It just so happened that the Grim Reaper was hesitant to take him because of what was about to happen. The loyal servants he had when he was alive simply abandoned his body. The level of neglect was like a father getting milk. He was just there in Rouen, half naked and unembalmed. Eventually, William's body started decomposing as if Beethoven unwrote his pieces. His body was being transported to Abbe aux Hommes in Caen for the burial. Using the Seine River might not have been the very best choice. It was hot, and it was perfect to decompose William's body faster. When they got to Caen, William was bloated as hell from gases by bacteria in his intestines, like Boomer from Left 4 Dead. The problems never seemed to end for William, even after death. A fire broke out. A man claimed stolen lands in the middle of the funeral. Let the man rest in peace, y'all. I'm not gonna lie. At this point, they should have just let William's body be eaten by vultures or maggots, I don't know. It's decaying for goddamn weeks. As they were putting William down to his stone sarcophagus, he didn't fit. His body was too swollen for it. And then the second death came. Workers forced his body into the sarcophagus, but his stomach just went boom. Since he's been decaying, whatever sprayed out of his stomach made everyone run out. It was that disgusting of a smell. Minus points for dying twice, minus points for a disgusting second death, minus points for dying from a tummy ache. It was a mid-death, but pretty brutal. So see it is. Bernd Jürgen Armando Brandes. This one is a little different than the rest. The other ones brutally died against their will. This guy Bernd, a 43-year-old engineer from Berlin, freaking volunteered. This absolute masochist applied on a posting by Armin Maywis on a site called Cannibal Café. Before burned Jürgen Armando Brandes came to his life, Armin was lost. He didn't find his food in the other people that applied for his posting. I mean, they were a match made in heaven. Armin is a 39-year-old computer technician who had childhood fantasies about being a cannibal. Burned wants to watch himself die. Burned even paid for Armin to eat him. That's what makes it crazy. Is this some BDSM kink you guys know? Please tell me. On the 9th of March, 2001, the two met at Armin's farmhouse in Rotenburg. Burned was ready. Right after going to the farmhouse, he popped a ton of painkillers and drank alcohol. Guys, I just read something. What? The? Hell. Let me read it to you in my own interpretation. They had a ritual. Burned asked Armin to chop his pee-pee off and cook it. What am I seeing right now? I feel unwell. Dude thinks he's Napoleon Bonaparte and I'm unwell. They both tried to eat the Tilly Willy Oh My Lord and Savior Magnus Carlson, but the flesh was too hard for them to chew. Burned was sad. That's something to be sad about? What? As if the next thing wasn't worse, which was to leave Burned bleeding out in the tub. What about Armin? You might ask. Oh well, he's just out there in the living room watching Disney, probably singing Look for the 
Bare necessities, that simple bare necessities. There's a man in my tub and he's bleeding out of life. Burned went in and out of his wits and consciousness before Armin got tired and just stabbed him in the throat. Armin then carefully cut the body parts like how Gordon Ramsay fillets his fish, stored it in the freezer, and ate all of it in several months. The guy became a full-fledged cannibal after eating all of Burn's fleshy weshy. He posted some more on the cannibal website. Unfortunately for him, some Austrian student looked deeper in Armin's archives and called the cops on him. He got arrested, sentenced for manslaughter, and now he works at the laundry. He also goes to church. Insert uncontrollable laughter here. Yeah, I meant to say that insert thing. But yeah, this might be brutal, but it could have been avoided. Had Byrne just logged off the website, cleared his cookies and cashy, and looked for professional help. He needed one F tier. Absolute F tier. It was also gross, so yucky. There are more people I can put in here, but I want to make content in more videos, so I'll make a part two, hopefully three, maybe four, somewhere around five, or whatever number.